organized uh, a meeting, I mean, a talk, and uh, by Tara Books, which was done by her colleague, Nita Wolf. And uh, they talked about, and I was very uh, touched by uh, the uh, one of the examples that uh, Geeta Wolf gave then about how they had uh, used the the you know hand binding for, for their books and uh, these became uh, like collectors items at uh, Getty Museum and I was really thinking that this is a great way to integrate you know um, craft labor we we may not always recognize these things but that binding by hand and uh, even uh, painting calligraphy these were the art forms of yester years and uh, so it was very nice to see that uh, uh, something some of these skills were not being lost so Ever since then, um, I have been wanting to ask uh, uh, Tara Books to talk about how they integrate uh, uh, art and craft in their books. And also that, uh, uh, I mean, I, since then, I think they've become known for their books using uh, traditional uh, indigenous uh, a painting, painting styles, and uh, and children sort of respond to them extremely, um, you know, naturally. So a big welcome, uh, Tara. Thank you for this. And uh, uh, I'm going to ask Mahesh Radha Krishnan, well-known architect, who also who did the building for Tara Books, and. Uh, when I went for the opening, I saw that uh, there were spaces in which, uh, you know, uh, paintings as uh, would be done in rural settings, paintings directly on the walls had been done. So I thought uh, Mahesh was the best person to introduce Geeta formally and also, uh, if he would like, to add a couple of uh, sentences about his own interaction with Tara books. Thank you. Thank you, Mahesh. Please take over. Thanks. Thanks, Tara. Uh, I think in this case, we have two Taras, Tara books and Tara Murli, so I need to be very specific. So thanks, Tara Murli and Intact uh, for this opportunity. Uh, it's a great privilege and honor uh, for me to introduce V. Gita and Tara books. Uh, who have been a great influence to people like me through their work and activities over the years, I've known them. Uh, I am actually going to make a fairly short introduction and probably you know, dwell a bit more uh, as my remarks uh, in, uh, in my interactions with Gita and you know, the work uh, Tara Book does. Uh, Gita dons several hats, uh, everybody knows. Uh, she's a feminist activist, writer, translator, and publisher. She's the editorial director of Tara Books. Her interests include gender, education, caste, and theater. She writes in English and Tamil, including translations from one language into the other. Her published, published works include books on the Dravidian movement, Imperia, Nonviolence, and Gandhi, Tamil cinema and popular visual arts, and several texts on gender and feminism. Gita has been active in the women's movement and civil rights issues for over 30 years now. Um, um, I've always been fascinated by what comes out of Tara books. So I try to sort of look back, you know, where it all started and recall my points of interactions uh, with uh, Gita and also Tara books. Uh, my first introduction to Tara books and V Gita in, was in 2007 at the book launch of the Nine Emotions of Indian Cinema Hobby. Um, of, uh, collaboration with coding artists MP Dakshana, V Gita, and Sirish Rao. Uh, my point of entry was this sort of, you know, popular culture book, a wonderful book, uh, which was also an introduction to Tamil aesthetic, uh, you know, presented following the imposition of ban on hoarding. It was very timely in that sense. Uh, 
later, while working on the book building, uh, you know, we had many points of interaction uh, in designing the building itself. And later, uh, in many different contexts of education, culture, and environment. Uh, in one such gathering, I remember, uh, you know, where uh, Gita was addressing students on the topic of self and society, where she talked about the origin of modular kitchen. That was quite fascinating. Then, you know, and um, you know, modular kitchen then called the Frankfurter kitchen by revolutionary female Austrian architect Margaret Schutz Lihotsky. Gita elaborated that this design as a response to women's struggle for economic independence and personal development to rationalization of housework and time spent in the kitchen. Now, it was actually a revelation to many architects, including me, who were in the gathering uh, and designing modular kitchens as an architect. And, and that kind of changed you know, a lot of my thinking over the years in looking at you know, spaces. Well, the last was more recent during the pandemic listening to the 10-part lecture series organized on reading Ambedkar, organized by the Ambedkar King Study Circle in Bay Area, a primer for anybody interested in current politics and social justice. Um, you know, in all these years, in all our activities, Gita bears the commitment in service of society. And to my understanding, her work with indigenous artists is a natural extension to this. Uh, let me try to unpack this, uh, and I'm going to borrow... Uh, a phrase that Rahul Mehrathar recently used called the British practitioner. I'm going to hesitatingly use that and I'm going to sort of paraphrase what he means by that. Uh, you know, he used this term British practitioner to define practices who bring together disciplines and synthesize complex conflicts of contemporary times and produce a work for future narratives. And that's what, you know, to me, the work of what Tara would does kind of represent. And I see this term as a perfect fit for the work what we, Gita, and Tara Bhukti does. And particularly the work that she's going to present today with indigenous artists. You know, it shows the bridging of different worlds and ideas together, providing a feedback loop that sort of informs the future narratives. An essential and important work in the time we live in through the medium of art, design, and bookmaking made possible through a deep collaboration. And I was witness because the way in which the book building you know, happened was also kind of a deep collaboration. Uh, you know, in this case with indigenous artists, designers, and writers. Uh, I, I too look forward to this process and lecture of how it is done. And uh, I now welcome V Gita to take over the presentation. Thank you so much, um, uh, Tara, for uh, inviting me on behalf of Tara Books to speak about uh, some aspects of our publishing journey. Uh, and thanks Mahesh for that extremely generous uh, introduction. Um, let me start with a, a very, uh, uh, on, a, on a historical note, because I think uh, uh, since it's intact, it's important for us to bring the history context in in some interesting ways. Um, during lockdown, I've been doing a lot of work on um, late colonial India, which is 1920s and 1930s. And one of the things that I noticed was that a lot of writing that was published during that time on a range of subjects from um, history to political science to biographies of important Indians, many of them were published from Madras by G.A. Natesan and Company and Higginbottoms. So I was thinking that there's a very interesting publishing history to unravel here, which is that Madras was the hub of what might be called um, a nationalist publishing endeavor. And um, in that sense, it sort of radiated outwards. Um, people sort of looked for certain things from Madras. And it also sort of brought things into the city um, just on that account. And I think G. Natation himself was an extremely interesting uh, um, publisher. And, he, and I mean, he's a man who wore many hats, but he was also an extremely interesting publisher. So I thought, Tara Books and many of us who have started um, and, and our work here as writers, as creative people, and who've continued to live here, can look back on a, on a, on a, on a, on a sort of interesting lineage. Um, there are, of course, any number of Tamil publishers to whom we can connect as well. But as far as the English publishing industry is concerned, I think the example set by um, people like G. N. Natation is um, um, extremely interesting. So I just want to put that on the table and sort of affiliate ourselves with a long 
history of publishing that was not just confined to things to do with chennai or with madras but which brought several things into our city and we see ourselves as also sort of doing that in a very modest way where we sort of have become a kind of hub for many things that come to us which we then share with our city with interested people um so that's the note that i would like to start on and um, just to sort of um, um, introduce ourselves um i joined tara books as a part time editor in 1998 um but i have been friends with geeta wolf who started this in 1994 and i supported the early publishing work that um, she very adventurously um, initiated i myself was busy at that time working on my uh, book along with sv rajadurai on uh, periyar and the non brahmin movement so i uh, sort of uh, didn't have time for much else and of course i was part of a feminist group in the city but tara books was very special because um geeta was a very special sort of person she uh, is who might call an intuitive publisher she sees a book when none of us can actually even discern one it could be an image it could be something that she reads somewhere it could be a new story and bang the book is there in her imagination and then um, we discuss it we talk about it we come to it as a group but i think it does need a very special kind of publishing intuition to 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 find a book where none exists so um so i started uh, geeta and i were part of the same feminist group so we were very good friends at that time and continue to be um that's how i started getting involved in in tara books but after i finished my book on the tamil non brahmin movement and periyar i um sort of got drawn into uh, tara's um, uh, work uh, initially a part of my workspace and time but I, gradually i became a full time um, person at tara but as mahesh said i don't know what that means because i do many many things and tara really gives me that space and time to pursue all my diverse interests but then tara itself is not just one of us you know in a sense it's a um, it's a collective there's there's the editorial and design team there's the production team which is also linked to our sc- um, screen printing workshop um then there's um um uh, the people that help us actually uh, send these books out our marketing and sales team the people who keep us going the accounts team the dispatch and for us each one of them is part of our creative space we don't see them as people who fulfill what we ask them to do but rather they are very vital aspects of how we function and um, in our monday meetings every month we sort of ensure that each of us knows what the other person is doing and mahesh knows this well because i think he observed us working when he was making his plans for the building and uh, the kind of collective spaces is created in book building are really sort of uh, answers to our purpose of working together some of you may have had the opportunity to read geeta wolf's essay in scroll um, which appeared um, today or yesterday i forget now where she speaks of how we work together as a group as a collective um so there's a constant back and forth constant conversation and i want to stress on this because whatever i say today has come out of that collaborative endeavor and i see myself as having learned any number of things by being in that collaborative space just as i think i've also brought some things from my own training interests and and um, and political concerns and i think that's true of everybody in tara everyone's brought something but everyone's also sort of learned in the process so which is why we think of ourselves as a collective of uh, designers artists and uh, writers based in our city um, then uh, uh, so uh, um, this is of course a very small part of a special space mahesh uh, designed for us book building and uh, we publish a range of books um, we uh, sort of keep adding to the different kinds of genres that we publish without quite focusing just on this or that we of course started as uh, children's book publishers um, but over the years i think we have got to be known for different things including um, our books that have to deal with um, uh, children's um, um, art pedagogy for children photography graphic narratives and more recently books that um, address the question of aesthetics and history um, drawing from the rich traditions that we've been working with for all these years 
We also have a line of stationery and prints, um, which we think are very important sources of supplementary income for our artists um, and for ourselves, of course. And all of this sort of is um, integrated into a very unique production process that we have at Tara, for which um, we are uh, we look to Mr. Armugam, affectionately known as Mr. A, who set up the screen printing workshop where our handmade books are printed and bound. But he also generally takes charge of production. He's a man who's learned on the job. I sometimes think that what Mr. A does not know about production is not worth knowing. Um, he's a hands-on man. He sits with the printing press. He uh, sort of tells them how to run their Heidelberg machines, though some of them hold degrees in printing technology, just because he's worked for so long on, uh, in a hands-on way on, on printing and, and publishing. So I think um, around production, along with our editorial and design inputs, we've created a range of uh, books over the years. Today, I'm just going to be focusing on our uh, indigenous uh, uh, our books that feature indigenous art. Um, this is not the only sort of uh, book that we do. We do have titles, as Mahesh was uh, pointing out, in popular culture, of, to which I'm particularly partial. Um, we also have um, books that um, engage with uh, contemporary issues for children. We have books in art pedagogy, and we experiment with the form of the book. Uh, I'll be speaking a little bit about that, but basically what I want to do is I want to focus and share with you our experiences of working with indigenous art traditions and artists, because I think this is something unique that we, um, uh, I think we can safely say we pioneered in the sense we brought most of these traditions into the form of the book. They've existed in some cases for centuries, in some cases for a lesser period of time, but mostly on walls or on the floor, or sometimes they made the journey to canvas and paper um, and cloth in some instances, but rarely into the book form. And um, I think we um, um, sort of have, have, have initiated that process by which the book is now available as a space for these art traditions to communicate and for these artists to put out their vision of the world. So in a sense, the book is like a mini gallery, um, and that, but it performs more than the function of a gallery because a book, unlike say um, a painting or, or an exhibit, um, is always sort of embedded in context. It comes with a certain sort of historical backdrop to it. It comes with arguments, uh, even if they are something sometimes as simple as a caption, but it helps to place things in context. And the book therefore has a longer life than an individual painting might have. Um, though there are others who might think differently, who also sort of see uh, art in museums and in galleries as enjoying an equally long life. But I do think books um, have a sort of a lingering um, existence across time. And uh, in that sense, by bringing these art traditions into the book form, we've also, I think, um, brought them into a different sort of history where they are not just going to be seen in terms of um, that moment of creation or that moment of, uh, of, of, of where we take it in, but where we can go back to them again and again. That's the best thing about the book that you can keep going back to it. And I think that will make for a certain intimacy with these traditions um, so that they don't remain distant and they become part of something we value in our own spaces. We might just live in a two room apartment but then to have a book which features art from across India literally brings India to our doorsteps in a way that um, I think um, no gallery can um, without sort of minimizing what a gallery does. I just as a publisher want to make a case for why the book is special and different. So um, now what do we mean by indigenous art? Now this is a question we've grappled with for a long time. And the word indigenous sits a bit oddly because Usually that book is used in context where there's been a colonizer who sort of created this difference between the colonizing presence and the indigenous population. Now, India is very complex. I mean, depending on what sort of history you read, um, many of us can be colonizers, many of us can be also colonized. So we can't use those terms as they are used in certain contexts, but we settled on the term indigenous because it seemed to cover a range of traditions, art traditions, that 
are not linked to each other, but which are different from what we would consider self-conscious modern traditions. Um, and our very first book featuring work by artists from these traditions, Beasts of India, uh, featured an essay called Art from Tribe, Court and Village. Subsequent editions don't have this essay, but in that essay, we sort of suggest what we mean by these, by using these terms. And we were hesitant about using the word tribe because of its pejorative colonial associations, but we weren't sure if the word Adivasi captured exactly the more commonsensical understanding of the word tribe. So, because Adivasi is also a political claim. So we wanted a more neutral claim. So when we say tribe, we obviously meant somebody who can claim to be outside of what is traditionally seen as um, the, the, the sort of caste system that is far more um, widespread than, than communities that have stayed outside of it. Now, this doesn't mean they're all entirely separate, the complex interactions, but this is a, these are, these are fairly self-consciously well-defined communities. And there are art traditions that have been part of these communities as part of their ways of life and so on. So the word tribe. Court is an interesting usage for us because as we know, there are many courtly traditions in India, but with court, we also sort of meant places of worship like a temple because temple art is also a very important aspect of our heritage. Um, but temple art is not simply art that is there in temple walls, but also art that has to do with particular pilgrimage sites or particular kinds of um, places of worship, like say um, the Nadwara artists or the Patachitra artists who are linked to the Puri temple. So in that sense, we use the word court to mean a patron client relationship, which is located within pre-modern structures where there's a prince and there's a place of worship. Um, and both of these are there in say a tradition like Patachitra and also in some of the Pahadiya paintings from the foothills. So that was the origin of the word court. Village is a far more broad term as we know. And this we use to refer to art produced in particular geographies in India. Um, this could be, you know, uh, something like Madhubani, which is from North Bihar. Um, it could also be the Patua scroll makers of um, uh, Noya uh, and uh, Nirbayapur in, uh, in, uh, in West Bengal. So these are traditions that have to do with um, um, uh, particular kinds of geographies. So that's how we conceptualized it many, many years ago. Today, we have a far more flexible definition and we've understood this by our conversations with artists, by what they say about themselves and what we've observed over the years. So for us now, when we think of tribal art or Adivasi art, we see it as a common resource that people in the community share. Some communities, only some people paint, but more generally in the modern period, these traditions have opened up and it's not simply the specialist painter or the shaman or, or, or the ritual specialist, but a lot of people in those communities have taken to painting as a source of livelihood, as a source of just, I think, um, being Adivasi also in a, certain, uh, in a certain sense. So anyone in the community is entitled to paint. So that's how we understand um, someone who calls herself an indigenous tribal or Adivasi artist. Then as far as the village arts are concerned, um, you know, Madhubani or Varli or, or many of these uh, the Patua scroll painters, initially particular castes might have done it. Like Madhubani, for instance, it was largely Brahmin and Kayast women who used to do it. But today an entire range of communities paint, including Dalits, including other uh, uh, communities in, 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 uh, in North Bihar. So um, they've also taken to it. Now, then there are communities which are, as I said, associated with temples or the court and they alone paint. Um, and that's largely for religious purposes. To my knowledge, a tradition like Patachitra hasn't quite sort of extended its reach. It may be that there are some people who paint who are not traditional Patachitra artists in Odisha. Um, but then because there's been a lot of very interesting interventions, um, the government of India, the government of Odisha and so on, and they've set up this heritage village called Raghurajpur um, in uh, Odisha. So it's possible that there are others that are also painting, but very roughly one can sort of think of indigenous art in today's context in, 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 in these ways. 
we started out with a certain set of definitions and today we have sort of um, work with these definitions, but we are very aware that all of these are really provisional ways of understanding a very complex phenomenon. Um, and we learn every day as we work with these artists. Now, um, the first book that you see there, Creation, that is what I would call a, a art from an Adivasi context, that's Gond art from um, uh, Madhya Pradesh. Um, the Gonds are, of course, a very, very large community. They are found across Central, Western, and uh, North um, and, and Central Eastern India. The Gond artists that we work with are from Madhya Pradesh, from Mandla district, um, and uh, they belong to a particular community called uh, the Pradhan Gonds. They are a very specific community uh, who have a long tradition of being artists and performers. So that's an Adivasi tradition creation. One of our uh, handmade books, which um, has been done by the wonderful Bajusham, of whom I'll be speaking off in a little while. And uh, the book brings together various Gond stories about creation. It's been uh, screen printed in a handmade workshop. Um, the sacred banana leaf that you see in the middle is Patachitra from Odisha. I still think, as I said, that this is restricted to a particular community. So in that sense, it's a village art, a community-based art. What you see there following my paintbrush is Madhubani. Now, Madhubani or Mithila art, as I said, has extended beyond um, um, Brahmin and Kais, the practitioners. And this artist, Dulari Devi, is actually uh, from a fisher community, an inland fisher community. So that's also interesting, you know, how these things keep changing. Because I think one of the things that many of us um, uh, think when we think of indigenous art, that there's something fixed about it. But um, as a very well-known uh, Frankfurt School historian put it, tradition is dynamic because tradition is not the past. Tradition is a relationship to the past. So in that sense, all these relationships keep shifting as time changes, as new challenges come forth, as communities change. Now, one of the things uh, when we started working with these artists and we sort of tried to get a sense of how do we understand them, one thing that struck us was that where do we even start? Is there a history to these art forms? Um, and where do we look for this history? And Bajju Sham at that time uh, and, and now as well, when, whenever he sort of talks to us about um, his own context, he once referred to uh, the uh, dignas or the, or the floor drawings that women in his community do, which are really rich geometric drawings, which are done in the courtyard, which is very much like our muttam actually. Uh, what we have in our old houses. It's very much like that. And he said, sometimes I think women's art is the alphabet of all art. And that phrase struck with us, stayed with us for a long time. That maybe many of these traditions that we consider indigenous began in the household. They had to do with ways in which women, mostly and sometimes men, brought a bit of joy, magic, and happiness into their everyday tasks. And sometimes these drawings that they made might have served a certain purpose, but perhaps there is something that is sort of ineluctably everyday about this art as well. And, and uh, which is why we sort of wonder the women's everyday art of which the finest example for us in Southern India, especially in Tamil Nadu is the Kolam, which we all know so well. And Tara actually did this very extensive workshop with the, uh, uh, women from different parts of India who do floor and wall drawings to this day. These photographs are actually from that workshop, which we did in 2013. And the column you see on the left earned a prize in that uh, usual Mailapur column festival. Um, so we started exploring what is the meaning of, 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 uh, of, of this everyday art and could it be a possible candidate as uh, sort of a, you know, the mother of all indigenous art, so to speak. I don't think we have firm answers on that to that question, but I do think it's a part worth exploring because there is something that links these art traditions in a very seamless sort of way to everyday life. Uh, and while today, of course, they have traveled beyond um, the space of the home and it's not only women who draw, still, I think historically, they might have had something to do with women's everyday work, with the domestic uh, spaces and so on. And here are some very lovely uh, art also. What you see on the left are the Sarguja artists from Chhattisgarh. Again, very beautiful, very simple. And I think Mahesh has seen some of their work on large sheets of paper. And this is, um, this is actually 
um, art that blends in with space. You know, it's an, almost an architectural detail in that sense. So um, the Sarguja artists do this to, on the walls of their homes. And you see those walls are beautifully sort of, uh, they've been um, done with their hands. On the right side, you see them demarcating a space, um, which is what they do whenever there is a function at home or a ritual. So there's a way in which this is tied in with everyday practices. Um, and um, more examples of that, um, everyday practices also include religious practices. They also include ritual practices and rites of passage. Madhubani, for example, and there you see a Madhubani, Ati Sarla Devi, um, just look at her posture. She was, she's 75 when she came to our workshop. Um, and, and, and she could sit like that and for at least a couple of hours and draw. So there's a great discipline. There's a great sense of confidence about what you're creating. And Madhubani, of course, initially used to be associated with rites of passage, marriage, fertility, childbirth, and all of that. And there's also a tantric aspect to it, which is only uh, practiced by the Brahmin women. Um, Madhubani has, of course, become many, many things. So that's also part of the household space. Um, and that's um, what you see there with the pot and the, uh, and the flowers is, is Madhubani done for a ritual purpose. And here you... I think she's experiencing some kind of an internet issue. I think she should be back in a few minutes. Sorry about that. The speaker is joining back in, in two minutes. She experienced a power loss, so she's just coming back.
Okay, I am unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah? Yes, ma'am. Can I? Yeah, sorry about that. It was a massive power outage in my building. So um, there's nothing I could do. Sorry, very sorry. So le let me continue. Um, so as I said, what you find with these um, traditions is that um, they are part of household rituals and you have Madhubani women being part of several such rituals. And then you have Digna, which is done periodically, uh, welcoming the harvest at the end of the rainy season and so on. And then in some communities, you have um, um, something like what you see on the top left, which is the Pitora artist, where the artist is different from the person who works with the art traditions to sort of um, foretell the future. He's a shaman. So that is a very specialist sort of art and artists who work on that form in today's context don't actually repeat the drawings they use for ritual purposes for other purposes. They may sort of give you something like that art form but not quite what is done for a ritual purpose. Then on the right you have the Madhubani um, 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 animals which are very well known which are part of many of their Puranic drawings. So basically you see that art has its origins in worship, it has its origins in the everyday, it has its origins in women's work, and it has its origins in what you do for another community, like you have at the bottom, the textile art of uh, known as Matani Pacheli, cloth of the mother goddess. And as you know, until very recently, Dalits were not allowed entry into temples. And one of the ways in which they offered worship was by building these makeshift shrines. And this community um, used to make these beautiful textile art forms for worship by other Dalits. This, of course, has changed today. And, they, and while they still make these, um, uh, the Matani Pacheri, they also produce secular art, so to speak. The point I want us to sort of keep in mind is that when we speculate that this perhaps emerged from women's everyday art, what we are saying is that it emerged from a space where art, ritual, everyday life, women's labor, and, and everything that happened around the household perhaps is the context for many of these traditions, though they may not just reference the household anymore. As I said, this is an idea which we have been trying to understand and explore, and Baju Sham thinks there is something to it, and th these are interesting aspects that you'd like to keep on. Now, what we do is, of course, we work with a variety of traditions, at least um, eight to date, from different parts of India, gone from central uh, um, uh, India largely. And uh, then you have Beel, um, which is also from central India. Um, we have Matani Pacheti, you have the Pitoras who are from Rajasthan, Gujarat, you have the scroll painters of uh, Bengal. Um, so we work with a variety of traditions. And when we say we work, what do we mean? We mean that we um, have a conversation with these artists in and through workshops where we learn what is it that they think is the basic fundamental uh, grammar of our, their art, which is something that they would not like to sort of take lightly. And what is it that they think they can innovate and understand and extend and you know take in other directions. And what we bring to the table is our experience as publishers. Um, our experience with narratives, with what works for the book and so on. So it's a very fruitful conversation. And as I said at the beginning, since so much of our work is collaborative, our creative work is also collaborative. So artists um, always say that you know about the book, we know about our art. So it's a kind of conversation between their confident sense of their own art forms, our confidence that comes with publishing, and what can we sort of bring together in this process. So basically, to get these art forms into the form of the book, these workshops, these conversations, these intense sort of uh, inter interactions are very, very important. And I think after having come to book building, where we have our own space now, these conversations have become far more relaxed and easy because otherwise you, you, you don't have space, artists don't have a place to stay, but now all of that has changed. 
So I think the space also has made these conversations very interesting. And Mahesh, of course, would know that too, because that is one of the things that he had to attend to in his brief that we'll have visiting artists and they'll have to sort of be part of the book building space. So we do that through workshops and through one-to-one -one interactions. Um, so that's very important. That's how we work with artists. Now, what are the kinds of things we've done with the artists? I mean, there's been never one way of working. So I, what I want to do in the rest of my talk is to take you through certain approaches we've, uh, we've, we've had in our work with artists. So what, how is it that we have managed to produce a range of books with these many traditions? So one thing that we've done from the beginning with Beasts of India is that, and this came about in a very uh, interesting way. Some of you might remember, I think it was 2000, when Chennai hosted a number of uh, art and craft uh, exhibitions across the city. People came from different parts of India and it happened over a period of time. That's when we met these artists for the first time. And as I said, Gita has this amazing ability to discern a book where there is none. And she was so excited after we had been to at least half a dozen of these places and she said, didn't you notice that all of them feature animals? Animals are very much a part of that world of art. And why don't we do a book which sort of brings together um, animals as they are found in these different traditions? And it was such an interesting tangential approach to working with these different traditions. So what we then thought was that we'll bring the animal or a set of animals that are commonly found in these books into an anthology of art. And but the thing is, and this is the book, of course, where we did that, and the, that's one of the older covers, that's a newer cover for the book. Um, but the thing is, these animals are never found by themselves. They're part of a narrative, they're part of a setting. And this, I'm sure you know what the story is. This is uh, Maricha. This is a, a panel from the Ramayana. This is Madhubani. So when we contacted these artists, they said, but we don't draw animals just like that. They're part of a setting. Some of them said, we can draw animals specially for you. Others said, you'll have to take what we have. So this is how many of them gave us their work. Not, they were not sure what we wished to do. So they were far more comfortable saying, take what we have. Um, and then we realized we had to extract the animal from the picture. And that's how the animal had to be extracted um, with, with design inputs. Um, once that was done, we also wanted to sort of show off that tradition to advantage, call attention to its salient features. And therefore, we decided that um, we need to put together some information. And the book has this index at the end where um, you can't see it very clearly, where you have the image, the name of the artist, uh, details about the style, which part of India it's from, what's the original uh, purpose of this art and so on. It's a very short kind of dictionary of these traditions, which is given to you at the end of the book. But really, what apart from setting the context and 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 and, and sort of pointing to how these traditions actually work, we did something more. Visually, we wanted to enhance the beauty of these traditions, and that's when we decided to screen print the book. This is what Tara was referring to when she mentioned uh, Gita's talk all those many years ago, when we did this amazing set of screen printed books on Greek classics for the Paul Getty Museum. But since then, the workshop has gone on to do very, many, many things. And one of the things we did with the very first book featuring um, indigenous art was to screen print those images. Because we felt the screen printed image calls attention to detail, and as you know, those of you who know the printing process, you know that the image sits on the page with a certain richness, density, and depth. You know, it's almost like it leaps out of the page. So the screen printing process we sort of utilized for the very first book. We don't do it for all our books, but where we feel the artist is, is sort of saying something through these visuals, which cannot be conveyed either through a caption alone or through a description, but it needs something else. Then we opt for a different printing process, whether it's a screen printed process. And today we have a lot of other, pro we've added on other processes, this Japanese thing called Rezo printing, where you print with soy ink and the good old letterpress. We've actually acquired a very good letterpress machine, um, which is there now in our workshop. So the printing process is not simply an add on. It's not simply something that um, adds monetary and aesthetic value, but it's very integral to how the book communicates. So that's the thing. 
So that's one way of working with these art traditions. The other thing is, of course, where the artists tell us about their lives, tell us about their experiences, tell us about the meanings of some of the art that they produce. And this is how we did one of our signature titles, the London Jungle Book, which we are very, very proud of. And uh, um, this is by Baju Sham, the great Bond artist. Baju actually came with a group of other artists. We had got to know him through Beast of India. Um, the Alliance France um, had a, uh, asked us to do a workshop with visiting artists from France. And we thought it would be interesting if she was in conversation with other artists from here. So Baju and others, uh, Durga Bai and, uh, and um, Buri Bai and Ram Singh Urveti, they came to this workshop and we worked with all of them subsequently, except Buri Bai. And Baju told us that uh, he had actually been invited to London some years ago to paint the walls of an upmarket Indian uh, restaurant called Masala Zone. And he had these hilarious stories about England to narrate. And then we told Baju Batak's a book, you know, you'll have to do this book on London. But he said, how can I? I don't draw realistically. We said, no, you can do this book with the bond, uh, uh, in the bond style. He said, I'm not sure how that will work. Then we said, why don't we work on this together? And he came and spent a couple of weeks at Tara. And we developed this wonderful book together. And um, it's and it's a very rich book at so many different levels. And those of you who haven't had a chance to acquire it, please do. Because nothing I say will do justice to what Baju has to say. You know, he really lets his images com communicate like this one. So when he had to leave for London, he says... And he has this very uh, sort of chatty way of talking about very profound things. So he said he felt 50-50 when he had to leave. One part of him was very excited. One part of him felt a bit unsure. He had never left home apart from going to craft fairs. So like this, for each of these paintings that he did for the book, he had a wonderful narrative. Um, and uh, that narrative was then put together as a caption and as a description. And sometimes he had pictures that um, were like both very funny, but which also captured something so wonderful. Like this one, for example, this is Baju's image of a London pub. And he said, oh, these British are so funny. They only come out in the evening to enjoy themselves like bats, you know. And so um, this is a London pub, which is like a tree on which all these people are gathered in their pubs drinking in the evening. So he had all these really rich ways of, uh, imagistic ways of conveying his experience of London. This was not a hand-printed book. This was a regular so-called offset book, which we published along with the Museum of London, where they had an exhibition of Baju's work. They invited Baju, they invited us. It was a very, very rich experience for all of us. And I think Baju did something to London, which was so unique. And Baju's father had actually worked with Verrier Elvin, the great uh, uh, ethnologist. And so Baju very casually said, Verrier Saab wrote about our people. Now we are now I'm writing about his. So it's a very interesting approach. You know, it's like post-colonial theory makes a big deal out of reversing the gaze, talking back. But for Baju, it was both the question of you go to a place, what do you do in that place? What do you learn from it? And how do you also respectfully keep your distance? Because he says, How can you know anything about a culture in, when you're there just for a month? So he didn't want to sort of say anything negative, so to speak. But he also had his own ironic vision of the city, like with that whole uh, English pub. But he also respected the fact that there's a culture from which perhaps you can learn something as well. And then he very sharply said, Verrier Saab wrote about my people, now I'm writing about his. You know, you can say it's reversing the gaze in some ways, but I think it's not a hostile reversal. You know, it's, a, it's an invitation to a different approach to the city. And I think Adivasi, especially... Um, um, world visions are, are something which we haven't tapped for what they tell us about ourselves, you know, because they also hold a mirror to us and they have a vision which makes you relook your life, which is what Baju did for London. Many a Londoner started relooking London, as John Berger, the famous art critic, said after looking at the book, makes you come back to London with a different eye. So that's what this was. So that's one sort of experience. But then there's a very local and other sort of experience like we did in this book, Following My Paintbrush, where Dulari Devi, uh, who is the artist, as I said, this is Madhubani, originally only Brahmins and Kayasta women painted. And Dulari was working in the house of a very well-known Kayasta woman painter, Mahasundari Devi. 
and this is how she sort of sees you know she she was a house helper she started out life as a fisher person but she was born into a very poor family she had to do household labor to sustain herself and she was working in mahasundari's devi's house as a house helper then she watched her drawing and painting and teaching other women to paint and she said why can't i do this myself i like making nice things also so that's how she learned it's a bit like the female ekalavya you know like she just watched and she learned but sad thankfully this has a happy ending no thumb was cut off but um, basically she became she has become a very well established artist and this book uh, following my pain brush um, charts her journey through art for children not for an adult reader baju's book actually has an adult reader in mind though the french edition actually is for children it depends on what we all think children ought to read i guess but this one is explicitly for children it's a very sort of inspirational book because we often associate art with leisure or with the middle classes or with someone who's educated or exceptionally talented but here's a woman who was a fisher woman was a domestic helper was become this wonderful artist so i think this um, as a book has a lot to say uh, to children as well about art about women's lives about how there's beauty and profundity in very ordinary things so this is another sort of experience sharing and we went on to do more books like that hope is a girl selling fruit is also a madhubani book by a young artist and the book is actually about her becoming an artist you know and you have a lot of these where men are concerned the portrait of the artist as a young man is a well known trope but what about the portrait of the artist as a young woman you know and that's something you have here in amrita das's book and tree matters is um, is a is a bee artist and she writes about her community's engagement with the forest um, and that's also a very rich sort of book a very everyday sense of of the environment um and uh, so when we say that we invite artists to share their experiences these could be exceptional ones like bajus they could be everyday ones like gambubais is with the bill uh, with the bill book then of course we work with them as illustrators um, and this is very interesting because writing your own story or your community story is one thing but to draw to somebody else's story is a challenge and here we find that the fact that many of these traditions are narrative traditions or even if they don't narrate a story they often tell a story through their visuals they take to stories very well as this book will tell you and this is a very interesting project we did some of you may know sultan azrim rokhaya sakhawat hussain was a very famous educationist from undivided bengal and she wrote this book after she had learned english and this was her first piece of writing in english and we published this book in 2005 for this very special reason that story was published in the madras review so we felt we had a chennai connection to the book as i said we do see ourselves as part of this lineage of international publishing that had chennai as a focus and so we sort of wanted to republish that story and we invited durga bai a gond artist to draw to it she is a wonderful storyteller she comes from a family of bards of singers and she's never heard the story before it's a it's a it's a feminist utopian um, a narrative and she just drew these beautiful images including women in a flying machine which you see on the screen and in the cover so here was an indigenous gond artist paired with a modern muslim educationist and 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 the results were wonderful you had a conversation between a very free kind of art and a very free kind of narrative so this is a book of, of which we are very proud initially we did this in the, um, using uh, the letter press um but this is now available as an offset edition and we've gone on to work with these art, uh, artists as illustrators in many many projects so this is the scroll painting of bengal as you see there and these scrolls are they unfold vertically and we sort of asked these artists what if the scroll were to unfold horizontally then it's like a book right and then you have the graphic novel so we did this workshop with a number of uh, scroll painters from bengal we suggested some topics some stories including of martin luther king and this is the book that came out of it very very proud of this book and a very wonderful um, um, book that um, again this is a lovely thing from martin luther king please notice the impossibly blue eyes of the white people it's a it's an amazing way by which they showed the whole politics of color in the book you know it was quite amazing um 
And here, for example, on the cover, you see this is Martin Luther King's famous speech, I have a dream. And the artist had put these faces in different colors saying they represent different parts of the world. So that's how they make that great imaginative leap when they are confronted with the new narrative. It's an amazing thing. Um, this, of course, is from the book. The other book that came out of this is this wonderful thing, Sita's Ramayana. And the artist here, and let, let me tell you another detail here. The Patua scroll painters are Muslims. They don't advertise this fact. And in today's India, we don't even know what that means anymore to advertise facts such as these. But her family has a tradition of painting the Ramayana. Her mother has done this enormous, humongous scroll of the Ramayana. So she came to the workshop and said, I don't want any of your stories. I want to do Ramayana from Sita's point of view. So it actually starts with the with the Mari, with Sita in the forest. You know, it starts from Rama being banished to the forest and Sita wanting the golden deer. That's how the thing starts. And we realize it actually has echoes of Bengal's own Ramayana, Chandrabati Ramayana. And we asked our young art, uh, writer Samita Arni, who many, many years ago had done the children's Mahabharata with us to also write the text for this book. And it's a beautiful text because I think with all the sort of very masculine, violent dramas that we are confronted with, you have a Rama who is Sita's husband. And you have a heroine who shows up all these, 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 these masculine visions of power for what they are. So the, this, this book really focuses on the women. It focuses on Sita, on Mandodari, on Trijata, and all the women in the epic. And, and the beautiful art, I mean, this is Sita on the cover. And it's a, it's a very sort of rich uh, retelling of the Ramayana, very much needed in today's context. Um, so that's one set of illustrations. There we really played with the form of the illustration, because if you see, from the scroll to the graphic novel is a big move. And we did this through a workshop. But in some cases, we work with the tradition far more sort of in a far more restrained way, like we did with this book, which is a Patachitra book uh, from Odisha. And Patachitra does this very beautiful circular drawings as part of their border images. Uh, and sometimes as their central motives. So this is a story which is, I think, perhaps from the Vishnu Purana, another very moving story about life and death how um, you can't perhaps sometimes stave off death. It has a slightly Buddhist overtone also. And here we've retained the form of the uh, original art in some ways, but then we wanted to enhance it in some manner. Um, there the scroll became a, a book. So here we've, what we've done is we brought this into the screen printing process. It's a very, very rich book. I'm sorry, but the Zoom screen that perhaps doesn't do any justice to it, but printed on handmade paper uh, with, uh, with a very sort of delicate art and screen printing at its best because the registration is perfect. Um, very delicate lines and, and different colors within the same space. And uh, that's what you have here. So when they work as illustrators, we either sort of stay within the art grammar that they know or we take it out into another direction without disturbing its grammar. Or we just let them sort of decide how they wish to illustrate. It's a, it's a combination of things depending on the artist. Um, the other thing that we have done is, of course, form of the book where we work with these art traditions and retain their original form, like we did with the tsunami book. When the tsunami happened, we realized that the story had traveled through television and through everything. And they had done these wonderful tsunami scrolls, the Patua artists of West Bengal. So when they we invited them to Chennai and they did this uh, wonderful um, tsunami scroll, which we then published as a scroll book. So here the form is very integral to the content. We didn't want to do much with this, except that when they drew, we said, give us some space for text. Because usually the scroll painters fill their, um, you know, frames. Um, and the text is a song that uh, they sang along with the painting. And this was reproduced as a scroll. So the form of the book can be also a way in which we retain the uh, integral aspects of the art. Um, and here we did something fun with the form where instead of the vertical scroll, we had the horizontal scroll and we came up with a story that would uh, appeal to the Patwas. They like these grand stories. So we told them the story of Noah's Ark. And since they are water people also, I mean, they are very familiar with both the Ganga and the ocean. They are from Bengal after all. So they did this wonderful long set of images about Noah's Ark. 
and then which we then sort of made into an accordion book, which opens up like that. Um, so the form of the book, along with the special features of that art tradition, makes for a very different sort of reading experience. And this is another book likewise. Um, this is B, and the artist did this one wonderful big painting, um, which captures what he calls the Beel Carnival. It's called Bagoria, which is a carnival which is celebrated during Holi. So we wanted to retain that whole painting without breaking it up into pages. So we converted it into a pop-up book. So you open it and there's a pop-up which comes up like that. And uh, there are other features to the book, which unfortunately a two-dimensional screen cannot uh, do justice to. But basically, we bring together interesting forms of the book to do justice to the art that we are working with. Just as a screen printing process enhances their beauty, the form of the book brings out the kind of compositional uh, details we wish to retain. So that's something that you see here. And this is a very special form of the book. This is Matani Pacheri, the, the cloth of the mother goddess that I, that I um, mentioned a while ago. So this is a textile book, actually. This has been printed on textile. The blocks were made in Machlipatnam by traditional block makers. It was printed in Chennai, um, which also has a long tradition of block printing going back to a while. And this is how the book opens up. And uh, we've put a, a printed sheet which tells you the story of each of these panels. This is basically a story about why the cloth painters started painting cloth, you know. So it's their sort of um, um, vocational uh, uh, story, so to speak. So this is a very one-off sort of thing, but I think now we are going to be experimenting with more textile books. This is a very, very, uh, very, very complicated experiment because it involved working with the artist who's from Gujarat, who did the original uh, drawings. Then you had to make blocks and the blocks were made in Machli Patnam. The printing was done in uh, Chennai. And before that you had to, uh, stitch the cloth onto cardboard because where are you going to print it? You can't just print on cloth. It has to work as a book. So a tailor was also involved. So, you know, Tara was talking about bringing together the artisanal and the art traditions. And this brings so many traditions into the form of the book. And this is one of our latest books. We are very, very proud of it because, again, the form is so important. This is Varli from uh, Maharashtra. And these young Varli artists were invited to Japan. And they worked on an island for, a, for almost a year. And they've charted their journey from their own part of, of Maharashtra, which is Dhanu, not far from the coast, but also home to a large river, from the river to the ocean, basically. And the book, as you can see, has many layers to it. And this Tara is, a, is also bound in very interesting ways. The Japanese style of binding, which is side stitching, um, which is open. And the book opens out as an entire sheet layer by layer. It's a very beautiful book. And uh, this is, uh, again, where to bring out the beauty, the form has been very, very important. Um, so that's another thing. And a very simple way of working with these art traditions is to treat these artists as our mentors, as our teachers. So we've created a bunch of activity books. Um, one of the most well-known is the Eight Way series. So we have eight ways to draw an elephant, to draw a fish, to draw a deer, and so on, where we feature art from different traditions uh, with information on these animals and also point to children what is it that they are learning. And one thing we've done very consciously, and anybody who's worked with Indian traditions knows this, that Indian traditions are not mimetic. They don't pretend to approximate to reality. And we wanted to communicate to children, don't feel frustrated if you can't get a three-dimensional drawing right. There are many other ways of depiction. And we bring this out very simply in the book. On the flap, we introduce the whole idea of what is art. And, and we say art is from the mind, art is from the imagination. So that's another thing we've done. Um, then a later series of books, as I told you, is about conceptualizing these art traditions. I started out with uh, our own ideas of what these traditions uh, started out as perhaps, but we've also been working with artists and asking their opinions. Where do they think their traditions come from? What is their understanding? Where do they see these traditions going? And we had a very unique opportunity to do this when Manav Sangale, the Museum of Mankind in Bhopal, uh, invited us to do a workshop with the artists that worked there on the idea of the museum. And we had this fascinating conversation with over 33 or 34 artists from different traditions 
whether a museum conserves or whether a museum freezes, you know, um, because they're all living traditions as well. And all these communities are our uh, citizens or, or, or our fellow citizens. They are not in the past. So how do they see themselves being put in a museum? It's like putting all of us in a museum. How would that be? And we had a very rich set of observations with artists saying that, well, if the museum wasn't there, some of these traditions would have been lost. With others saying, well, a museum is a bit like a rat hole. The rat might store a bit of grain, but who is going to bring home the harvest? You know, very suggestive way of thinking about the museum. For some others, the museum is a place where you bring from your own household to the household you marry into something of your mother's home. You know, it's like a natal home. So very, very rich insights. And the book has their views. But it also has our own argument about how do you understand museums today? And their views are not simply verbal, they are visual. All of them have drawn the museum, conceived of it in a certain way. And Baju was very central to this process. He worked with us on this book. He spoke to the artists. He helped us connect with, with them afterwards. So here is Baju talking to Gangubai, who's a bean artist. Um, this is one of our latest books where we've tried to sort of understand how is it that a tradition becomes a tradition. The Gond artist, Baju, for example, Gond art was never what it is today. People didn't draw on the wall. People didn't draw anywhere else except in their homes. But what made this particular group of artists who were all part of drawing in their domestic space become world famous today? And Baju took us through his own journey in art. And he also pointed out it has to do perhaps with his village. So the book is called Origins of Art, the Gone Village of Patanga. How can a village be the source of a tradition? What is it about the village that allows you to become an artist? And it's a very wonderful, and, and this goes back to our earlier observation that everyday life can be a source of very rich art. You know? And um, this is Baju's village. Um, and this is a beautiful painting he did of different soils in his village, which is part of the book creation. And in the book that is paired with the actual village. And you can see where the inspiration is from. It's not mimetic. It's not something that he consciously does. But clearly that village has shaped his imagination. And Baju doesn't live there anymore. He lives in Bhopal. So it's a very interesting way in which a space stays with you in your mind. You know, And as architects, I'm sure you all relate to that very well the way a space can impinge and shape your imagination. And, and this is a wonderful example of how spaces create landscapes of the mind, how spaces create art. Um, and it's a very, very rich book. And we learned a lot working with Baju on this project. And you, you, can, you can again see the relationship between art. This is an image from one of our books featuring Gond art. These are instruments that they use. These are their uh, various other things that are part of their everyday life. So without being mimetic, how do you retain things, you know? Uh, and, and that's, I think, a very interesting part of uh, our own exploration into aesthetics, which is not mimetic, which is not about realism alone or about, as in Western tradition, some things that's the opposite of realism. There's something else that's happening here which we need to understand. So that's from the book. Um, more images. That's Digna. That's their home. And this is the courtyard Mahesh see their courtyard where they are doing their dignas. Um, so, and again, the women, look at their posture, look at the confidence with which they, you know, um, handle space and so on. More art from the village. The, and Baju says, says something very nice. He says, nobody sets out to be a, a wood a, a wood carver. Of a day, you will be grazing your cows. You'll see a piece of wood. You'll go around and fetch something and you'll start carving. You know, now there's a market for these pieces. But basically, he says, that's how these things came into existence. That's how my uncle drew. That's how my cousin started sort of doing things. So wonderful pieces of uh, masks and wooden sculpture from the village. And um, this is a, a bar, what they call a bujruk, who sort of is a genealogist. And Baju sort of pays homage to him in London Jungle Book. And, and so we thought, you know, Baju obviously has remembered that somewhere when he sort of um, makes himself a bujruk in the book. That I have become a genealogist, a new kind of genealogist, because I'm telling something else with my story of London now. So the way the village is figured in Baju's imagination and in the imagination of other Gond artists 
led us to explore the possibility of a space, a geography being very instrumental, very central to the making of a tradition. So that's what Origins of Art is all about. And uh, that's actually with that journey, we've come a long way from, you know, anthologizing particular kinds of art, asking artists to share their experiences, uh, working with them in ways that enhance their, the beauty of their art and, and, and also um, bringing together specific traditions and specific forms of the book. And today we feel that there is so much to be learned from the aesthetics of these traditions things that tell us something about how art traditions evolve, relationship of art to life, how do artists see their work. And the, this is still untraveled territory in some ways. And uh, I am ending with this very beautiful photograph of Baju drawing. Um, uh, and it's a very, very evocative photograph, which tells you so much without me having to say it in words. So I um, think I've taken a lot of your time. Um, and this is really one very small part of our journey. There are many, many stories to tell. But thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to do this. And thanks to Intac and, and everybody else. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, Adyamba, are there any questions? Um, no questions as of yet, Andre. Yeah, can I can I yeah. jump in, Geeta? Yeah. Yes, sure, sure. Yeah, uh, Geeta, I remember. I think the first conversation we had when we sat for the book building, I think when you talked about uh, you know indigenous artists, I think one of the first things that you mentioned was uh, you know Baju Sham's experience and the London Jungle Book and so on, and. Uh, and we also see the same sort of narrative in Teju Ben's uh, you know, uh, work. So this sort of binary representation, or, or sort of the binary way of looking at the city and the sort of village, is is that a you know consistent sort of narrative in the space uh, you know of these artists? Uh, and 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 how does one look at it now today? I mean this. Do we still kind of hold that binary in the way we look at it, or, or can we go more deeper into their landscapes? And yeah. I think that uh, the binary is really only in the narrative. The actual, even London Jungle Book, for example, Badu has a very deep sense of leaving his village and coming to the city. Um, but I don't think he sees it exactly as a binary. There's a continuum because they keep going back also, back and forth. And in Origins of Art, that's what we've tried to capture, that how does that village, that, that landscape continue to mean something to them, live in their imagination? It's not that they want to romanticize it, not that they want to exchange their city life or to go back to the village. They want a constant back and forth, but they also value that very much. And I think, I think it's the ground of their being almost, you know, you can't be what you are if you don't have that connection. And I think for some, it's far more grounded than others. For Teju, going back would be very poignant and tragic also because that was not a very kind life. She was very poor in the village. It was a nomadic existence. And the city has been kinder in terms of material uh, uh, comfort to a certain extent. But Teju can't stop working. I mean, and, 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 it's, and it's been very difficult for people like her, especially during the pandemic. Um, but but I think it's not quite a binary, and we've tried to avoid seeing that as a binary. And the actual narratives are far more complex, though there are certain images which might suggest that you know there is this village and then there is the city. But having said that, I would like to emphasize that point that that home space is the ground of their being, um, I, and I, there's a great deal of uh, attachment and strength to that space. And in the pandemic, also one of the things that I learned was say, if you have construction workers or Adivasis who come to say Gujarat or some place, they are the only ones who have a very rich going back and forth thing. They cannot stay away from those spaces for too long. I think there is something to be said there. I'm not sure what exactly it is, but uh, there is a back and forth thing. And has Baju's work changed now? I mean, is there any kind of a uh, influence of the current Days of living on his work. Yes, Baju's work has changed quite a bit. It changed even while we were working with them. The London Jungle Book, for example, um, 
we spoke to him a lot about space you know that you don't have to fill the entire space like a diagonal will change the way the painting looks you know? right. so and in, in that sense he was very open the thing is the artist who's very confident in her or his tradition can take in new inputs without changing the grammar so there are there are there's another way where you can be very eclectic you can draw from different things and then you create a pastiche but none of these artists want to do that they are very clear that this is my grammar i i will extend its frontiers i'll do things with it you can show me some new stuff but i i'm i'm very clear about it. yes there are lots of new things he's done but they are not something that are ungoned if you know what i mean okay. Uh, geeta i just want to make a comment uh, i recently read a book called uh, by orhan pamuk called a strangeness in my mind and uh, of course you know art and orhan pamuk my name is red yes. everybody sort of knows about you know the conflict or that is there in artist's mind between the freedom of the west and the you know the the repetitive nature of uh, 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 uh miniature art especially in turkey i mean that is that's not the point but here he actually talks about he he has spent come to from a village to istanbul as a boy of 12 and has lived all his life in istanbul but to him uh what he initially did which is selling a drink called boza which is a, a, a traditional fermented drink and he he says only in selling that and seeing the city through the eyes as he is selling it does he actually is he able to relate to the city and uh, i think he also as you mentioned he is not nostalgic about the village but his roots from the village come through even as he is living in the city for almost all his life and i think that i mean that uh, it is a i think many of us in that sense feel you know what does the city have to offer me but many of them don't even those questions don't arise they know how to you know sort of adjust to where they are with the confidence that they have in themselves and they know what it is that uh, you know brings happiness or peace or whatever it is and from what you described i don't know if i'm extrapolating a little too much but it's that sense of in a sense a sense of peace and comfort with what they are doing and how they are doing it it doesn't matter where they are doing it that i think is a fairly um, fairly true of most of them but interestingly also baju once said uh, about traveling to the city you know he said the rich travel to spend money we travel to make money <laughs> so it's also choiceless in some ways especially for adivasi so city after after having happily taken away their lands they have no choice but to come to the city but I, having said that i i think tara has a point that there's a way in which they inhabit their own selves with a greater degree of poise and grace you know they are not torn apart by the city i mean they suffer a lot in in in, in very many ways they are, they are they are exploited they are impoverished but there's a certain core that they retain most of them at least which i think uh, is very precious to them and, and and the artists you see that very clearly but i'm sure it's there in many number of people i mean um, um and i I've, i've heard this from people who work with adivasi workers from different parts of uh, people in movements and so on yeah it's a very uh, very unique thing i think um it's almost 8 o'clock now so i think uh, we'll close the meeting i just uh, uh, geeta I, i honestly this has been a terrific talk and i wish our audience there had been more of them but i i i think this is what we at intac are trying to do also is to bring sensitivity to the art form to the artists 
to intangible heritage of the communities how to keep them going and how to see and see how space affects the continuation of this art or craft or whatever it is and i think um, you have you have uh, tara you and tara books and geeta wolf have done it in a very wonderful and special manner and i think where it has enriched both you and them so to say and i hope that uh, we will be able to take forward this sort of you know uh, interaction in our work as well thank you very much and uh, 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 may i say good luck and more success in your efforts and uh, mahesh thank you so much because i think you having worked with the at with tara books i think you had a, a special relationship and uh, your introduction of geeta brought it out and uh, thank you very much for this whole uh, uh, you know participation with our talk today thank you geeta thank you so much thank uh, you. ara and others at the end thanks mahesh thanks thanks geeta we'll hopefully meet up one of these days yes yes see you yeah. thanks thank everybody for listening thank you, thank you.